Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. So I decided that this would be a good video since I've been talking a lot about stem cells and exosomes. Um, I think it's important to know the difference between where they come from. Um, I think one good rule of thumb to know is that the younger the source, the better the cells. Um, that's sort of the general vibe I get from a lot of the stem cell clinics that I have been talking to and also just generally what my doctor has been telling me when it comes to um, stem cells and exosomes. If you don't know what exosomes are, there's an exosome playlist. Go take a look at that. Um, I might even put this in my exosome playlist just to have it um, there for reference. So um, I did a consult. I did several consults with stem cell clinics recently and um in one of the one of the consults that i really liked um i i don't know i guess i i know that there are different sources of stem cells but i didn't really know that there there's like some really strange places that you can get stem cells from and so i really liked this consult that i had i really liked the doctor she seemed very cautious she seemed you know like she was you know not trying to sell me anything and finally, you know, once I, I got closer to making my final decision of what, um, of where I was going to go, I decided to ask her, you know, where are the cells coming from? Um, because I know that in her, you know, the, the clinic that she's at is famous for having treated a, a very, um, famous hockey player. And I believe they had used um, um, embryonic stem cells, which we know that there's a huge, huge controversy over embryonic stem cells. And I thought that was weird because embryonic stem cells are not really used anymore. And so, you know, I, I asked her like, you know, what, where are these stem cells coming from? And she told me dental pulp. And so that's what made me very, very curious because I had never heard of dental pulp stem cells before in my life. I don't really even know what dental pulp is. Um, obviously, it kind of grossed me out. Um, and judging by judging by this rule of thumb, the younger the cells, the better. Um, dental pulp doesn't sound like something that is very young. It could, I, I imagine it could come from any age of person. So I'm going to go down this list. Um, I will get to the dental pulp <laughs> and I'll get back to dental pulp in a minute. Um, yes, it is. It, it kind of turned my stomach to hear that. Um, but I kind of wanted to go down the list. And um, once again, I'm not a doctor. This is just um, basic research. And from what my doctors have told me, from what the stem, stem cell clinics have told me, and um, this also may affect cost as well, so keep that in mind. Um, but I, I figured this would be a good video to make that way, you know, all the different sources, as weird as they may be, and their different uses and the different controversies behind each one. So obviously, number one would be the best source. Um, so we're going to go from best to worst or we don't really know yet. Um, so the best source would be human embryonic stem cells. Um, and obviously this is the youngest type of stem cell because it's in an embryo, a human embryo, which is basically not even, you know, a, a person yet. Um, so very, very young. Um, and it's, there's lots and lots of stem cells in embryos. So this is the youngest that you can get, obviously. But we have heard lots and lots of controversy over the years, over decades. Um, once stem cells kind of came into more of a, a mainstream medical consciousness, there were a lot of questions being asked about how ethical that was. Obviously, um, if you're Catholic or if you're any kind of Christian religion, it's contraindicated. It's against your religious beliefs. And I think that's where a lot of the, um, the controversy lies. It's mostly your religious beliefs and, um, that kind of thing. Um, I think they're also risk the riskiest cells because they can become 
any type of, I mean, that's, that's the good part is that they can become any type of cell. Um, but I think that's also bad because they can become any type of cell, including cancer cells, tumor cells. So I think human embryo, hu embryonic stem cells are, apart from the, you know, religious controversy, um, they are also, I think, a bit riskier because they can just transform into anything. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're, from my understanding, we're at a point now in stem cell research where embryonic stem cells are really not necessary um, because there are other very young types um, like cord blood and cord tissue stem cells. So this is the one that uh, seems to be highly recommended by my doctor and seems it seems to be sort of the, um, the gold standard for stem cell therapy. And also you're looking at, um, speaking of gold, it's going to cost you probably about the same. It is very expensive. Um, I don't know what embryonic stem cells cost. I don't even think they're being used anymore, but I can only imagine. But cord stem cells are really, really expensive. They are the purest and the youngest tissue-specific cells. Um, and um, like I said, they're second to embryonic stem cells, but tissue-specific, they are the youngest. Um, they function more quickly and effectively. So they technically, technically they are more efficient overall. Um, these are the stem cells that you would be that you would see being used for you know kids that have leukemia and that kind of thing. Um, typically, uh, parents would bank these when their ch children are born, save the umbilical cord. This is this is when you think of uh, stem cell banking or cord banking. Obviously, this is what we're talking about, um, and I believe more and more people are doing this now because if your child does get sick. Uh, for example, with leukemia, um, this is basically the I think the most um, surefire way to um, to stop the leukemia in its tracks. Um, obviously, chemo is uh, the more common treatment because cord banking is expensive, so a lot of parents don't do it because of cost. Um, but I believe cord uh, using your cord stem cells for leukemia treatment is the most effective way to just really um, to know that you're going to get, you know, the cancer resolved. Um, but chemo, chemo can do the same thing, it, but I believe it is um, probably more dangerous and it's more drugs for a longer amount of time. I don't really know exactly. Um, I know from my nephew's experience, he did chemo, um, but I know that the cord blood and, or, or the, Cord banking is becoming more and more recommended, especially when it comes to issues like that. Um, so that's the kind of thing, you know, that's what you're going to see a lot of um, probably in the future. Hopefully cord banking gets a lot cheaper because um, I think more people are going to be interested in it. I, I'm sure leukemia is not the only thing that it could treat. I know that now parents are using um, cord cells or they can use cord cells for um, uh, like autism treatment and things like that. But we will talk more about that later. So next after cord, uh, cord blood and cord tissue is obviously placental. Uh, so you can, uh, the placenta and the amniotic fluid contain lots of stem cells. And so, you know, I mean, obviously that's also quite young because it's where the baby grows. The issue here, though, is that there's a mixture of stem cells. So I can see, um, I can see where this may also be costly and also not as efficient and not as, I guess, pure, um, because you've got a mix of baby stem cells, which are new, and mother stem cells, which would be older. So remember, the younger the cells, the better. And if you have your the mother stem cells in there, mom is not going to be as young as baby. And so there's going to be a need to separate out the stem cells, which obviously is a more involved process. I'm, I'm sure it's not like 100%. You can't completely separate every single one and get all of those cells out. Um, but either way, it's going to be a more involved process. I'm pretty sure that makes costs go up. Um, and, you know, less efficient 
I'm assuming, and less stem cells as well. It looks like there may be a lot of stem cells, but if half of those are in the mother stem cells and you're not really getting as many as you think you're, you, you are getting. So placental, I guess if you can't get cord blood, um, then placental would probably be the next best thing. And I do know that there are some products, um, stem cell products and exosome products on the market that do, that are derived from placental. Um, after placental, you have bone marrow. So bone marrow is, now we're getting to some of the more commonly used um, stem cells. Uh, obviously cheaper, but there are more hurdles and more um, contraindications with these types. So bone marrow, rich in stem cells. You got a lot of stem cells in there, but you're going to have a much more involved process to get these out. And typically they come from, they come from the person that they're going to go back into typically. Um, so uh, right now the, the treatment or the condition that I have seen this used most, uh, most commonly or most often in is for autism. And so uh, what, what people will do, what parents will do is, well, I don't want to say parents, what doctors will do is that they will take the child, uh, put them under anesthetic, go in, um, I'm sure it's like a big giant needle, and uh, you got to get into the bone marrow, take those cells out, um, purify them and do whatever you got to do because you have to obviously remove the stem cells, take the stem cells out, and then reinfuse them into the patient. So obviously this is painful. I don't know if you're sore after. I imagine you would be sore after even, you know, after you get out of the anesthetic. Um, and it's the same in adults. I'm just giving the children as an example because it seems to be a very, very popular treatment right now for, um, for autism. And this is how they do it. Because the child is still young enough, um, like I said, the younger the cell, the better the child is still typically young enough at this point, so their cells can be used for their own self. Um, and, and they are typically pretty good cells. Um, this is used in adults as well. The problem with adults is that obviously if you're getting cells taken out of yourself to be put back into yourself, you're probably sick or you probably have some kind of a condition that you're trying to treat. So the question is, why are you taking diseased cells or potentially diseased or aged cells and reinfusing them back into a diseased and aged body? You know, it's almost like kind of redundant, right? So once you get older, yes, you can do it and, and you might get some results from this kind of um, bone marrow stem cells, but, um, you know, it it's, seems kind of counterintuitive. Uh, especially if you have a pretty um, advanced disease. Uh, one of the major risks here is also something called graft versus host disease. I don't know much about this disease. You might want to Google it, but I do know someone that got this disease. Um, he was an adult with leukemia, which as you know, leukemia in adults is um, a death sentence most of the time. Uh, but I believe he got his stem cells from a sibling. So obviously, they're not your own stem cells. And there's a higher chance of rejection and your body not responding well to something because it's foreign. And that's exactly what happened. Um, so there's a higher chance of graft versus host disease, especially if they're not your own bone marrow stem cells. Um, he is alive. He did survive. But he did have a lot of problems um, down the road, ended up needing a double lung transplant. Like I said, I don't know what graft versus host disease is that well, but it is a potential complication from bone marrow stem cells um, and stem cells that just aren't your own. So after bone marrow, you have peripheral blood. Um, so I'm guessing like when they just, when they draw your blood, they do something to the blood. And I think you see this a lot. Um, I think... It's not, it's not PRP, it's something different. And I feel like I see this a lot at, at stem cell clinics that are here along the border, like in TJ and, you know, really close um, down here along the southern border. And um, they basically take your blood and 
they take it out and they do some kind of extraction process, take out the stem cells and then reinfuse you with your own stem cells. Again, you're going to have the same issue that you had with the bone marrow ones because if you are going in there and getting treated for some kind of a disease that you have, you know, your blood is not going to be that great. Um, and also, obviously, your age, if you're already older and if you're older, if you're diseased, you're not going to get a very, very good quality stem cells. Um, also, you're not going to get as many stem cells. So peripheral blood stem cells, it, they don't contain as many. So you're going to get a smaller dose of stem cells. Um, this is also used. Um, so if any of you guys have seen the new documentary documentary about Selma Blair, I believe they did this with her. But remember, she had um, she had chemo to basically kill her immune system. And then they took her her own um, blood stem cells. The, the only thing is that it is, again, a more involved process. They had to give her medication. I believe this is something called aphiresis or aphiresis. I don't know how to pronounce it. So they give you medication so that you start producing more cells. So your bone marrow releases more cells into your blood. Um, and then after some time, they, ex they take out your blood, they do the whole purific purification process or extraction process, and then they reinfuse you with it. Obviously with her, because she had chemo done and all of that, um, it proved to be effective with her. Um, and also they probably wanted to give her her own stem cells because I think there's less of a chance of rejection, but it is a much more involved process, takes more time, um, and, you know, it's, it's just not as efficient or effective for most conditions. Um, it is, uh, it, I, it, I saw something that said it has a slower engraftment process, so your body, I think, tends to accept them a lot more slowly. I think that's what that means. Um, and again, there is an increased risk of graft versus host disease. I think even more than with um, bone marrow. So again, as we start going down the line of these uh, of of these different tissues or different places where you can get stem cells, we're seeing less and less efficient, um, less likely to help. Um, I think a lot a lot of times they're also less likely to last. So if you do see improvement, because there are some people that will see improvement with all of these, um, but I think the lower we go down on the list, the shorter the time frame of improvement that you will see. And I feel like when I've you know done my research, um, and I or I've talked to other people that have had these procedures done, and they talk about having received their own stem cells, um, it seems like it doesn't really last very long. They, they will feel better or they'll feel a lot better um, like right away and then it kind of just goes away over time. So uh, I think that might be also one of the drawbacks. Um, this next one is one of the most popular uh, I think here in the U.S. because it's not as heavily regulated and that's fat which is also known as adipose uh, stem cells. It's not the same as other types of stem cells. So these stem cells cannot be used to treat cancers or really serious diseases. I think they could treat like heart and kidney disease, but typically I don't think these types of stem cells are used for serious, serious conditions or cancers. Um, they're, like I said, it's not as heavily regulated because it's your own. They typically take out your own fat um, they like liposuction it out. And again, they go through that purification process. They take out the stem cells and then they reinfuse you with stem cells. You'll see a lot of this like in the beauty, um, like cosmetic surgery world where they will um, like reinfuse you with your own stem cells from fat. Um, I've also heard that people that get fat taken out and do like fat grafting, which is almost like fillers, like taking your fat from somewhere else and putting it into like your face to kind of smooth out the wrinkles or like putting it in other places. Um, they say that you also get benefits because the fat has stem cells. So it not only will fill, you know, hollow areas of your face, but it'll sort of like help the tissues and stuff to like heal and your skin to, to look better because there are stem cells in the fat. Um, so that's kind of one use that I've heard of. Um, 
it could treat some autoimmune illness. Again, as we get lower down on the list, the effectiveness or the efficiency does not uh, work as well. I did read a blog recently of a girl with Lyme disease. Um, I read the blog recently, but it took place, I think, in like 2017. She did get her own stem cells um, reinfused, and I believe they were fat uh, adipose stem cells. She did report that she felt better. It took a while. She did feel a lot better and she was doing uh, really well. And then I believe after a year, she started kind of reverting back to how she was before. And that's what I'm getting with a lot of these procedures where they take your own stem cells out of your own adult body, adult diseased body. I feel like I see that story um, quite a bit where people will feel a lot better for a while and then suddenly it's like they lose all of that improvement and it makes a lot of sense because you know your your body is is not doing well why would you give yourself your own you know crappy stem cells you know what I mean so I mean that's just kind of the way that I see it it's not and this procedure is not as restricted here in the U.S. and basically everywhere else because it's your own stuff right so you're it's it's a very low chance that you're going to contract a disease off of it because whatever diseases it that are in it you already have um and again the whole graft versus host thing i mean it's your own stuff so you're not going to reject what is your own thing it's i guess it's like the lowest risk um but also the lowest effectiveness and finally we get to the last one which is dental pulp so <laughs> this is where we started the video Yes, it's very gross sounding. Um, I did not know that this was used for uh, stem cells. Um, apparently, it's very, very new. So I'm not going to be able to tell you whether this is a very effective um, type of stem cell. I would say based on what I've seen and what we've talked about with these other sources, I would say it's probably not the best source. Um, this is the newest type and the newest source to kind of come out on the market. So we don't really know that much. Um, it's similar to like adipose stem cells in the sense that um, it's probably the lowest risk, but it's also not very efficient um, or effective. And that's not gonna be used for any very, very serious diseases like cancers and things like that. Um, again, might work for an autoimmune disease Kind of like what I was saying with this girl with Lyme disease, um, maybe heart and kidney disease, but we really just don't know. Um, I imagine it's going to work very similar to fat, um, like adipose stem cells or maybe bone marrow. Um, and again, I'm like the, there are a lot of questions with this one that I had that you know I I didn't I didn't talk to the I didn't do another consult with the doctor because once I heard dental pulp I was like doesn't sound good to me. My doctor definitely wasn't going to recommend it. And I, I mean, just logically, from what I know, I was like, that doesn't sound great. Um, whose dental pulp is it? It's obviously not mine, <laughs> you know. And what is dental pulp? I don't know if dental pulp is like your gums or the stuff that's like inside your tooth or if it's the tooth itself. Um, so... Yeah, like I, I just really don't know. There are so many mysteries surrounding the whole dental pulp that I, I really, I kind of wish I would have done another, another consult just to hear what she had to say. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's not very well studied from what I'm seeing. There's just not a lot of information on it. And like I said, I don't even know what it is. Is it the actual tooth? Is it, you know, the pulp? I mean, pulp just sounds like gums and skin and just a lot of grossness. But um, yeah, that's the lowest one on the list. I imagine it, it will probably remain the lowest one on the list as time goes on. I don't think that this is going to be like the best place to get your stem cells from. Um, but yeah, that's just ugh. every time I think about it, <laughs> it just grosses me out. Obviously, it's not very expensive. So just for a um, like a ballpark figure, uh dental pulp stem cells I got a quote for about six thousand dollars and I think that was like an infusion of them I guess 
um, I don't know. I don't know the numbers or the billions of whatever stem cells were in it. But my, the quote that she gave me was about 6,000. On the other hand, I did get a quote from umbilical cord stem cells at around $19,000. So you got the high end and you got the low end. So there is a difference in price. Like I said, I don't know if it's the same billions or millions of stem cells, but I do think that just the source will make a difference in the cost. I'm not saying they don't work. I'm not saying that they're not going to work or that they can't provide relief for other conditions. Maybe you are a migraine sufferer and you're, you want to figure, you know, try something different. I don't know if stem cells are used for migraines, but you know, I think if you've exhausted all of your other options, you know, a $6,000 IV of pulp stem cells or your own adipose fat stem cells may be worth the try, may be worth a try if you're, you know, if, if you have kind of like a really bad case of migraine. Um, but other than that, you know, I hope this is, this was a bit of a long video, but I hope this is a good primer for, um, you know, for people that are looking into stem cells because I didn't know anything before going into it. And I literally have had to learn as I go. Um, and it's it's been, you know, kind of...